Greetings and welcome back to room 303 in our Talks with Walt as we are calling our readings through the deathbed edition of Walt Whitman's Leaves of Grass. We are now in the Calamus section and we turn to the second poem, Scented Herbage of My Breast. One of the most amazing poems. I, guys, 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 I've been working really hard to not argue or make the argument that this is the very best poem in all of Leaves of Grass because there's just too many great poems in Leaves of Grass. But guys, this is one of the more amazing texts. Hey, do you remember how when we studied the Odyssey together at LearnStrong.net, all of our lectures there, that I said that one of the most compelling symbols all the way through is the symbolism of weaving? We're going to see something very akin to that. And do you remember that I made the argument, you can't really read T.S. Eliot, especially for quartets, without appreciating what's going going on in Leaves of Grass. I'm going to try and make that argument at the conclusion of this one as well. Now our assumptions are that you've been with us through um, all of our different lectures. LearnStrong.net, Talks with Walt is the playlist. Everything from the inscriptions all the way up through in the Calamus section in Pad's uh, Untrodden, the last poem that we did. My hope is that you for sure have watched our intro lecture to the Calamus section. If you haven't, it's uh, a lecture that's there provided for you in the descriptions box. Hey, just because we're there, do you remember when we opened our study in cabin ships at sea? And do you remember that we had these lines? Then falter not, O book, fulfill your destiny. You not a reminiscence of the land alone. You too as a lone bark like a ship, cleaving the ether, purposed I know not. We're going to see this I know not a lot in this poem. Whither yet ever full of faith. Consort to every ship that sails, sail you. Bear forth to them, folded my love. We're going to see this language of my love as it relates to his talking about this thing called leaves of grass, ultimately. Dear mariners, I mean, thinking of course of, TS, uh, of Tennyson and Ulysses. Dear mariners, for you I fold it here in every leaf. Go back to that lecture uh, in Cabin Ships at Sea. And I go through very deliberately why Whitman called his poems his collection of poems, Leaves of Grass. Now we're going to hear this word leaves repeated, that's why I'm pointing it out to you here. All the way from Iliad 6 to Aeneid 3 to Dante's Inferno to Milton's Paradise Lost to Shelley's Ode to the West Wind to the book of Isaiah 40 verse 6, All Flesh is Grass, to finally the fact that, to finally the fact that printing leaves are in fact what is left on the floor and of course the pages of a book are the leaves of the book. So we're going to see all of this here. Now Norton's will tell us a bit of background here that's quite I important for us. The second of the 1860 Calamus group, this group, uh, poem remained substantially unchanged except for the dropping in 1881 of the following line after the present seventh line, quote, O burning and throbbing, surely all will one day be accomplished, end quote. The intricate symbolism, to continue with Norton's, of the embl emblematic and capricious blades is difficult to follow. Even the poet in line 22 cries that they serve him not, but it's clear that in this poignant confession, love has led him to think of death as a deliverance. D. H. Lawrence, the great, the great writer and poet, reflecting upon this poem in Studies in Classic American Literature in, in, in 1922 says, or remarks that, quote, Whitman is a very great poet of the end of life, end quote. The exultant celebrator of life is also the solicitor of death which to him is not morbid, we immediately think of Emily Dickinson here, don't we, but beautiful, right? Esther Shepard has made the interesting discovery that in his concept of death of tomb leaves growing out of his breast, Walt Whitman was influenced by pouring over illustrations in Ippolito's Rosaniel's um, account of the Egyptians, which show the burial chamber of Osiris, from whose mummy are sprouting leaves of grain. It's, it's an amazing thing. He would have seen some plates in a book that he was looking at at the Astor Library, and he wrote of it, in fact, in Life Illustrated, uh, December 8th, 1855. Now, we're going to turn to this poem. Um, hey, guys, I wish that I could read this in its entirety and then come back to exegete, but we just don't have the time. This is one of those poems I could easily spend a couple of hours on. I'm going to obviously fight the temptation to do that. But right away, notice that herbage is blossoms, Breast, of course, we have to think about Song of Myself, Passage 6, Breasts of Young Man, as well as Song of Myself, Passage 24, the breasts that press against other breasts. So obviously we're playing all kinds of echo types of, of things here. Scented herbage of my breast. Leaves, it'll be used nine times in this poem. Leaves from you I glean. The only other use of glean was in our, in our study of idol. Let's go back to the inscriptions and to our lecture there. I write to be perused 
best afterwards. This is one of the key ideas of Leaves of Grass, and we see it a number of times. As great as he understood Leaves of Grass to be in his own time and place, he was completely convinced that you and I would be reading his stuff many years later. And of course, we have to smile as we say that, don't we, right? Tomb leaves, we think again of the comment that she just made about our sires. Body leaves, right? Growing up above me, above death. So this idea is that this text of his is going to outlive him. When we finish and we do our very final lecture together, the last text, Farewell My Fancy, we'll come back to this poem and these ideas of this poem. Then he uses the word perennial, which is significant because he's going to use this a couple of times. For him I sing as, um, as some perennial tree of its roots. We're going to come back to roots here in a little bit. Or Song of the Redwood Tree, a perennial heartache life. So we're going to, we're going to um, have perennial used here two times. Perennial roots, again, we're going to see this a couple of times, this word roots. Tall leaves, and then he'll use this word O, and it'll remind us of starting from Palmanach 19, where ten times it was used there, here. It's this O, 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 again and again. Of course, it's a static, almost like sexual erotic language for this O. O, the winter shall not freeze you delicate leaves. Every year shall you bloom again. We're back to Irvidge, right? And again, this notion of blooming again is reincarnation. Whitman was very interested in the eschatological idea of reincarnation, thinking, of course, again of W.B. Yeats, right? Out from where you retired, you shall emerge again. And this idea comes up again in Song of Joys, to emerge and be of the sky, one of the other times that the word emerge gets used. Oh, I do not know, Think, takes us back to Song of Myself, Passage 6, which is why we read it in our intro to Calamus, right? I do not know whether many passing by will discover you, of course, discovery is central to our reading thus far of Leaves of Grass, or inhale your faint odor, and for those of you that are smiling already, because you've heard this already, this, in, this, this, this powerful notion of inhaling to, uh, what, what are we doing? And forgive my exuberance, but what are we doing? Well, we're smelling leaves of grass the way you would put your nose into a bunch of flowers and you would just take in that amazing smell. We're doing the same, the same game here, right? But I believe a few will, and this is again one of those kind of future hopes of leaves of grass. We've seen this already a number of times, right? Oh, slender leaves, go back to Song of Myself, passage 33 to see the use of the word slender. Oh, blossoms of my blood, notice the repetition here, the echoing and repetitions of my blood. The whole idea of blood in this, in this uh, poem alone is remarkable. And then notice the exclamation marks that start to be used. I permit you to tell in your own way of the heart that is under you. And this idea of uh, prepositional phrases are so significant in women. I think that's where T.S. Eliot learned it. Go back to our lectures at LearnStrong.net, over four quartets. And Burt Norton, we're going to go to East Coker at the end of these comments, right? Oh, I do not know. Notice again the repetition of this, I do not know. What you mean there underneath yourselves. Go back and read Song of Myself, Passage 6, to just feel the power of the lines we're reading here. You are not happiness. Yes, we did see this at the end of Song of Myself, this discussion of what is happiness, right, or Scooby Snacks, right? And again, as we said, he, uh, Whitman was so influenced by Thomas Jefferson's Declaration of Independence, that most precious of all poems, we could argue, right? And the idea that happiness comes up two times in that document, it's quite remarkable. You are often more bitter than I can bear. Now this is interesting as he starts to talk about a different perspective on the very idea of this herbage and these blossoms, right? You burn and sting me, yet you are beautiful to me. He of course loves the word beautiful, doesn't he? You faint tinged roots, again, roofs of mouth is the way it's going to be pronounced in, in uh, passage 6 of Song of Myself. You make me think of death, and then he repeats it. Death is Beautiful. You remember he says in passage 6, luckier, right, right, he will say it. The beautiful uncut hair of graves is the way he says it in Song of Myself, passage 6. Death is beautiful from you. And then two times he uses these parenthetics to remind us again of Emily Dickinson, right? When indeed is finally beautiful except death and love. And then that, 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 that kind of question mark. It's kind of a, a, a question. I think he learned this from his reading of Shakespeare. The way he can kind of almost step out of the poem and ask, what indeed is finally beautiful except 
death, and love. Now this will take us back to our study, of course, of Plato and Socrates. You'll remember what Socrates argues, and we say it uh, proverbial that way, right? You swing at the part, but not for long. The fan is always waiting, and you know that it's coming. And what is it that Socrates says? All of us must say at the end of our death, all of us speak the same words, oh my God. The question is, of course, the inflection of the voice. For most of us, it's, oh my God, oh, crumb. I, I wish I had my life just for a little bit longer. We think of the Scrooge story. But there are a few people, and this will be for Whitman and his goal, who can say the words, oh my God, at the end of the life, and they're ready to go to the van. They've swung well, and this is, of course, the challenge that he will see as he's talking through these poems. Oh, I think it's not for life I am chanting here my chant of lovers. Again, go back to uh, what we read at the very beginning, right, when we were messing around in cabin ships, right? I think it must be for death, for how calm, how solemn it grows. By the way, the word calm in leaves of grass, just run it down to ground, it's amazing. It grows to ascend to the atmosphere of lovers. Now this ascending idea, and the very idea that he read from the biblical text of the Jacob's Ladder, and the idea of ascending and going up, obviously he learned it from Plato's study, uh, the study of Plato's Republic as well, opening lines of Republic. I went down to the Piraeus, you'll remember, go back to our lectures there, right? Death or life, I am then indifferent. It's fascinating that he uses this word again because in Song of Myself, passage 13, remember he said indifferently before death, after death, you remember that? My soul declines to prefer. And then in the second parenthetic, I am not sure, but the high soul of lovers welcomes death most. Has to be thinking, of course, when he says high soul of, the, of lovers, has to be thinking, of course, about Socrates and Plato's apology, right? We've given full lectures all of, on all of these texts at LearnStrong.net. Indeed, O oh death, I think now these leaves mean precisely the same as you mean. I love that he uses the word precisely here. Grow up taller, sweet leaves. Remember in Song of Myself, Passage 24, that Calamus, sweet flag, remember this, and even in sexual rendering. Sweet leaves that I may see, start to pay attention to all these exclamation points. Grow up out of my breast, go back again to Passage 6 of Song of Myself, Spring away from the concealed heart, there spring. I mean, we just think of the opening lines of, uh, of Little Gidding, right? Of T.S. Eliot's work or uh, Midwinter Spring is its own season, right? Um, and, and, and again, here notice the use of spring. Do not fold yourself so in your pink tinged, he loved to do this hyphenated uh, word stuff, roots, we're back to the roots again and taking us back to um, uh, For Him I Sing timid leaves. Now the use of the word timid here is fascinating from Song of Myself, uh, passage 46, of course. Don't wait timidly holding on to your plank. Now I will you to be a bold swimmer, right? Remember all of that. Do not remain down there so ashamed. We've seen this idea, right? This idea of being abashed or ashamed or somehow embarrassed. Herbage of my breast. And again, notice five of these exclamation points in a row. And then, I told you, it's the very first word of all of Leaves of Grass, the deathbed edition. The word is here now. Come. I am determined. Do you see it's an alighted verb? I'm determined to unbear. We have to think about passage uh, uh, um, five of Song of Myself. Unbear, he says. Come. I am determined to unbear this broad breast of mine. Notice the repetition of the word breast. Just go back and count how many times the word breast gets used in this, right? I have long enough, back to our passage 46, long enough have you dreamed contemptible, contemptible dreams. Now I, I, will, I uh, will you to wash the gum from your eyes to be a bold swimmer. I have long enough stifled and choked. This imagery of choking that is in the same point, uh, poem with the word Chanting is truly remarkable, right? I choked emblem emblematic and capricious blades. It's an amazing uh, use of the word, right, to talk about grass. I leave you. I'm telling you guys, he had to be smiling when he wrote these kinds of lines. Leaves of grass, but he loves the word leave here to, use, to be used as a verb. I leave you now. You serve me not. I told you he loves this word now, now and here, all the way through leaves of grass. I will say what I have to say by myself. 
five times now the I will phrasing in, in this anaphora kind of representation. I will sell myself in comrades only. Go back to the previous poem for comrades, right? I will never again, he loves this kind of repetition in this phraseology, utter a call, only their call. I will raise with it immortal reverberations. Later we're going to see out of the cradle endlessly rocking the way that the reverberations gets used through the states. Two times we're going to get this repetition of the idea of states, right? And go back to inscriptions for this states project. I will give an example to lovers to take permanent shape and will, through the states, give through me shall the words be said to make death exhilarating. Interesting. Only use in all of leaves and grasses this moment now for exhilarating. Give me your tone, therefore, O death. And Whitman has always been about voice and tone, hasn't he, right? You want to be a good writer? Become a good reader. What are you going to read? Poems like this. Give me your tone, therefore, O death, that I may accord with it. Give me yourself. Um, now, this, this O death thing that he keeps repeating makes us think, of course, of John Donne's uh, famous sonnet, Tan to Death, right? O death, where is thy sting? Give me yourself. For I see that you belong to me now above all. Notice his repetition of the word all. And are folded in separately together. You, love, and death are. They are synonymous in, Whitman, in Whitman's study, obviously, of Plato. Nor will I allow you to balk me. It's, a fun, it's an interesting use of the verb. Balk me anymore with what I was calling life. For now, it is conveyed to me that you are the purports essential. Now this idea of essential, remember in the preface that, you, that he said the United States themselves are essentially the greatest poem, he comes back to this word essential, that you hide in these shifting forms of life. And the minute you see the word forms, you think of course of Plato's Republican form theory and all of that. For reasons and that they are mainly for you, that you beyond them come forth to remain. What an interesting syntactical construction the real reality. Remember in book seven, go back and read and, and read it again. Look at our lecture over it. We're sitting in a cave of shadows. We think they're real, but they are in fact not real. We're dragged down into the light of the sun, and of course, there is the true reality. He's playing a very similar game. Now behind the mask, later in a poem called Visors, in a section called By the Roadside, we're going to see this um, uh, this idea of perpetual uh, natural disguise. As he'll talk about masks. Think about gun bars, um, uh, we wear the mask. That behind the mask of materials you patiently wait, no matter how long, and this idea of how long we've seen, of course, in Leaves of Grass. Notice the repetition of that, the Sanaphoria, seven times we get the word that. That you will one day, gotta love perhaps, take control of all. I think this is where T.S. Eliot learned things like um, uh, the use of the word perhaps. Remember in East Coker 5, perhaps neither gain nor loss for us, there is only the trying, the rest is not our business. You'll remember that when we talked about it. That perhaps, one day perhaps take control of all. Notice again it's repetition of the word all. That you will perhaps, repetition of perhaps, dissipate this entire show of appearance. And, and again, not only is that Platonic, but obviously Shakespearean as well, right? That maybe you are what it is all for. But it does not last so very long. We'll see this word long used many times, of course, in Leaves of Grass. It will be the last word of this poem. But you will last. When lilacs last in the dooryard bloom comes to mind very all right, what's going on just to finish here? Well, it's a brilliantly constructed poem. At 2A, death is, of course, conquered by leaves, that is to say, by life. That's his hope, anyway. At 2B, the repetitions are just mind-blowing in a poem like this. Go back and read it again to hear the echoes again. The symbolism of leaves is compelling, of course. I mentioned T.S. Eliot and Four Quartets. Just go back to my lecture on, for example, East Coker Five. So here I am in the middle way, having 20 years, 20 years largely wasted, the years of Walter Daguerre, trying to learn to use words, right, and every attempt is a different kind of failure. Go, go back and take a look at the way in which that set of lines directly comes, I believe, grows, can I use that verb, right out of a set of lines like this. It's truly amazing. Finally, at 3B, how am I going to own a poem like this? Well, I love to ask this question after reading a poem like this. What leaves will you leave? that last beyond death? What a compelling question. And after reading a poem like this, this is the kind of poem that you got to turn around and go on and go share with somebody else. Why? Because leaves have a tendency to grow into more leaves. Thank you. Have a blessed day.